I, I want to make one announcement, I guess, before we go to our speaker, and I will make this again later if I can remember. And that is, we are, we do meet the first Friday of the month, every month, except we're going to make a change in January. Um, those of you who've looked at your calendars may realize that January 1st would be the first Friday in January. So we changed our meeting time for the January meeting from the first Friday to the second Friday. So, uh, so TAAA will be meeting in January on January 8th which is actually the second Friday. So I'll try to remind people again about that. Uh, since it's a change in, in procedure here, we probably need several reminders. Okay, our guest speaker for tonight, uh, we're really glad to have with us, it's Dr. Paul Smith, who works at Stewart Observatory. And, and I only, in going through Paul's vita, only found one mistake that he may have made in the past, and that was he got his degree from the University of New Mexico instead of the University of Arizona. But you know, he realized his error immediately and came right away to work at the University of Arizona. And he's been here committed to us since then. So, um, so we will claim him for sure. And we re very much appreciate his being with us tonight and, and presenting to us. And so Paul, are you ready at this point? I, I think I am, although I've already made a mistake before the talk started. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we all have these old past history things that we just have to overcome. But it sounds like you've been, been very successful in overcoming yours. Well, we shall see. <laughs> uh, let's see. Shall I uh, go ahead and take over your screens? Yes. And how is that looking? Great. Good. All right. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. Um, uh, there are actually a, a couple of people in your organization that I have uh, issues with, but an organization as a whole, uh, TAAA is, is, is OK. So. Um, and in fact, those individuals are listed down at the bottom of my title page here. Um, so uh, basically, we're going to be talking tonight about the uh, Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope and uh, about research that has been done in the field of AGNs. And let me explain uh, what the acronym means. Uh, AGN is an active galactic nuclei. So these are the very bright cores of a minority of, of distant galaxies that put out an enormous amount of energy. And that energy, we believe, is coming from the process of accretion, material falling onto a very massive central object. Uh, in this case, we believe a what's called a, a supermassive black hole. And so it's material infalling into this black hole that's creating all of the energy that we're seeing. These objects uh, generally are the brightest objects in the universe that we know of. And uh, there's several types of AGNs and we'll be talking about one type tonight um, and hopefully we'll have some fun with it. Uh, it, it has to be a quick stroll because uh, one, they've only given me a half an hour and I'm pretty long winded so I could go all night. Uh, and plus the photons that we're going to be discussing tonight are literally lethal. These things uh, will kill you in short order. And this is another reason to um, uh, be grateful that we have the atmosphere that we have around the earth. Um, not only can we breathe it and stay alive that way, it protects us from small flying rocks, uh, get, uh, cosmic rays and gamma rays. So with that, uh, this work was done in collaboration with Gary Schmidt, who's now retired from the University of Arizona. His big contribution here was the in he built the instrument that I used. Uh, Buell Januzzi was also on the original proposal to do this project. He is now uh, director of Stewart Observatory. 
And as I said before, uh, a couple of your members have assisted me with this, with this work. Uh, Dennis Means, uh, telescope operator at the Stewart 90 inch telescope where a lot of the observations were made. Uh, this project actually, it is believed, uh, has driven him into retirement. Uh, Gary Rosenbaum uh, is still working at Stewart, but as uh, anybody who knows him, this project certainly has taken a toll. So thank you to them and all the others at Stewart, anybody in the, uh, in the association that, I, that we couldn't identify uh, that works at Stewart. Thank you very much for the uh, support over the years. So on back, way back in June, 2008, the Gamma Ray Space Telescope, uh, which was named for, after Fermi, a very famous 20th century physicist, the physicist that created the first uh, nuclear reactor and played a big part in the development of uh, the atomic bomb, Enrico Fermi, uh, that spacecraft was launched from Florida uh, on a uh, Delta II heavy rocket. And this started a new era in, in astronomy, in high energy astronomy. Um, it's the successor, the mission is the successor to Compton, which flew in the 1990s. And Compton was one of the four original great telescopes envisioned by uh, NASA, Hubble being the first, uh, and Compton and Chandra, the X-ray telescope and what turned into uh, Spitzer, the infrared analog, which flew in the early 2000s. Uh, Compton's mission uh, lasted for five years and that was the only real look we got at the high energy universe. And by high energy universe, I mean, we're looking at light of very, very high energy compared to what our eyes are picking up. Um, so aboard Fermi, there were two instruments, the gamma ray burst monitor, and this detected gamma ray bursts, which uh, has been a very active field in astronomy for decades, and is believed those are short-term gamma uh, bursts of gamma rays that are believed to come from collapsing stars at the end of their lives. So stars that are turning themselves into neutron stars and black holes, if they create certain structures uh, that we'll talk about later, you can get a gamma ray burst for them. But they last on the order of less than a second to a few seconds, very short. And then there's the LAT, or what's uh, known as the Large Area Telescope aboard the, aboard the spacecraft, which is the primary instrument. And that's what we'll be generally talking about tonight. And the picture of the spacecraft you see in the, uh, in the clean room there is Fermi with its uh, solar wings folded up. So it's a nice compact. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture that gives you a proper scale. But if you look very carefully, there's an engineer squatting right over here to give you an idea of the size of the spacecraft. It's a pretty massive thing because the detector, this is the gamma ray telescope, this silver box up here, which is about, you know, you wouldn't think a, a cube would be a, a telescope, but it is. And it's a very special type of telescope, something that you, you know, it's a very uh, classic uh, physics experiment. This is kind of an instrument that you would find at the end of a cyclotron on the earth in, in a physics lab. And how this telescope works is quite a bit different uh, than how our own personal telescopes work. You have a gamma ray come in and gamma rays of this energy are so unstable around matter. Uh, so you just put them around matter and they become more and more, it becomes more and more possible for them to turn themselves into uh, particles or real matter. This is a real E equals MC squared situation where energy turns itself into matter. And so it comes through and interacts with the atoms in the, in the spacecraft and, and turns itself into an electron-positron pair. The positron is the anti-particle to the electron. Those two have different charges, of course, because they're you know, the anti-particles of each other. So the electron has a negative charge that's 
the E minus, the E plus is the positron. And since you're orbiting the Earth here, you're seeing the Earth's magnetic field and the magnetic field splits the track of these two particles. Positive particles go one way, negative particles go the other way. And that's why they split on this diagram. And when they hit the detectors uh, at the sides of the uh, instrument, their energies are measured. And then you can go through, you can backtrack it through by knowing the energy of these two electrons. You can backtrack it to uh, what direction and what energy the gamma ray photon had. It's, it's quite spectacular. I mean, this, this instrument is a very much a synthesis, synthesis of, 18, of all the physics we've learned in the 18 and 1900s. Um, it just uses everything and it, it takes advantage of all the high technology you can have. Very fast and accurate clocks, uh, computers, uh, solid state physics, uh, the whole gamut. So it's, it's quite a spectacular uh, uh, mission. It turns out it's about 30 to 40 times more sensitive than EGRET was back in the 1990s. It covers it's sensitive to a much broader range of energies. And physicists love, in high energy uh, physics, love to e measure energy in units of electron volts. And that unit is sort of the, it's, it's what the energy of an electron would have if you put it across one volt of potential. So after that, you know, what the energy is. So an EV is a very small unit, and then, but you can think of it this way. Um, 14 of those EVs, actually 13.6, if you have a photon of 13.6 EVs and it hits a hydrogen atom, that's enough energy to knock the electron off the atom. And so you'd be left with a free electron and a proton. That's only 14 EV can do that. That energy there is in the pretty far ultraviolet. If you were exposed to that light for a long time, well, a fairly short amount of time, you get quite sunburned on that. And that's only 13 EV. What Fermi picks up is millions of electron volts to billions of electron volts. That's the GeV here. So, I mean, being hit by one of these photons is like being hit by a bus almost. It's not very good for your health. And that's, you know, one of the great advantages to having a nice, relatively thick atmosphere that we have around Earth in that you have to go to space to see these things. And that's a good thing because if we were seeing them on the ground, we wouldn't last very long. All, all life would be really challenged under such a bombardment of, uh, of light. Um, so Fermi's in a low Earth orbit, so it, it goes around the Earth every 90 minutes. And in every two orbits, it basically sees the entire gamma ray sky. Um, so, and it has no expendables on it. Nothing runs out like on some of the other telescopes, like when Spitzer uh, ran out of liquid helium, it warmed up and most of the detectors it had on that spacecraft couldn't operate anymore. Fermi doesn't have any expendables. It's still operating today over 12 years since its launch. What we'll be talking about today is what happened in the first decade of that, uh, of that mission. So that's Fermi. Its mission, um, it had, after it was launched, it had a quick 60-day in-orbit checkout to check everything, uh, that, uh, check if everything was working. The official science mission began in August of 20. 08. Uh, almost all of the data that came out of the uh, large area telescope uh, was proprietary during the first year to the instrument team as a reward for building this thing. Um, so they got first dibs on the data then, but after that, all of its data is public to everyone. Uh, researchers, uh, the public, anybody who wants to go into the database and see what the gamma ray sky is doing they can do that. Um, for almost all of its time 
in the mission, it's been in the survey mode where it's basically been looking at the entire sky and building up statistics uh, on that. So it doesn't, it's not an observatory that looks at individual objects, although you can use it to do that. It's, it's really not done. What you wanna do is, is uh, look at the entire sky and uh, build up your photon count because you're not getting very much. Um, uh, as uh, it, it, I think it, somebody told me that uh, mostly what Fermi sees is background radiation that has to be um, rejected basically by the computer algorithm. So it's not, it's not mistaken for a, a real, you know, extra, you know, uh, interplanetary gamma ray. Um, most of the gamma rays Fermi sees are from cosmic rays hitting the upper Earth's atmosphere and creating gamma rays. And so, and, and Fermi sees about 200 of those a second. From the rest of the universe, from everything else in the universe per second, Fermi sees two. So you can see that, you know, being up in space for a long time allows you to build up a lot of photons but you've got to reject a lot of uh, a lot of noise, and that's where the the high speed computers and the um, uh, clocks come in as you're trying to separate photons you're interested in from photons that you're not. So um, NASA invited U.S. based scientists to compete uh, for funding to do research on on Fermi data through the Fermi Guest Investigator Program. And, and that's where everybody comes in. So I, I mentioned that uh, I got assistance from people like uh, Dennis and Gary uh, throughout this project. Uh, I was one of those US-based scientists that competed for funds and got the funds to do the project that I'll, I'll describe. But remember, all of these funds are coming from the United States tax as you know, has uh, science works in this country, uh, big projects like this, and most science in general, uh, the government decides, you know, how much money it wants to spend on research and sets that aside for uh, scientists to compete for those funds to do research. And those and other scientists decide, you know, panels of scientists decide, you know, whose research is most important and whatnot, and, 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 uh, and then get the money to do the research if they're successful. And it's a very competitive process, but the underlying funding comes from the American taxpayer. And I should take a moment to express thanks for all of you out there um, that some of your hard earned money has gone into projects like this. And um, of course the government subdivides the money, you know, certain amounts of money go towards, you know, medical research, some goes to physics and astronomy and, and so forth. And of course, those allocations aren't even, uh, and, uh, you know, there's a lot more money available now, I would say, and always has been for say vaccine research. Uh, and that's a good thing. But fortunately, this, this country has seen, uh, seen it to be beneficial to support things like astronomy and exploring the universe to try to understand our place in it. So, uh, so the guest investigator program, that money goes into theoretical investigations, you know, what, what creates these, these photons, um, uh, basically uh, refining how to uh, uh, analyze the complex data set that Fermi gives you and observations at other wavelengths to complement the high energy data. And that's outlined there in yellow because that's the, that's the research project, type of research project that uh, Stewart Observatory was involved in. And here, after five years of being in orbit, here is the gamma ray sky from Fermi and uh, this shows the entire sky with the galactic poles on top, the galactic equator, or the what is the Milky Way along the uh, along the equator there. This is the Milky Way, and those gamma rays there are created by this diffuse emission. Here is created by cosmic rays, the same ones I talked about before. These are 
very fast moving uh, nuclear particles moving around close to the speed of light, they run into an atom, mostly hydrogen, in the interstellar medium in the galaxy, and that creates gamma rays. And that's how you get that's how you get the, the Milky Way showing up so nicely. The points you see there are usually one of two things, the type of AGN that I'll be talking about or pulsars with the AGNs being in the vast majority. And you can see that a lot of the AGNs are um, off the Milky Way. They're all distributed all over the skies. You would expect from uh, sources of gamma rays from other galaxies, say, whereas if it was from stars, it would be like be just at the Milky Way. Uh, but pulsars are also an important point source on this map, but they're only about maybe a tenth of the number of the AGN that you see in this picture. So it's these most of the it's these points above and below the Milky Way that we'll be uh, we'll be talking about from here on. Uh, so, as I said before, what does Fermi see? It says a lot of, it sees a lot of AGNs. Um, after the first year, um, 671 gamma ray sources uh, associated with 79 AGNs um, were confidently dis uh, seen by, by Fermi. 300 of those 671 are what are, are from objects that are known as BLAC objects. Uh, and the other half of that 671 um, were what are called flat spectrum radio quasars. And I'll get into a little bit of what those are. We've got 41 other AGNs of other types and 72 objects that we don't know the type of yet. Um, but the catalog that Fermi built up after just the first year was, down, as expected, was dominated by AGNs because that's what Compton saw. But I, I forgot to say, to give you an example of how much better Fermi was from the original Compton experiment back in the 90s. In four days, Fermi can do what Compton did in its entire five-year mission. So it was a huge leap in sensitivity and uh, you know a real boon to this kind of of research. Um, so AGNs dominate the gamma ray sky, and here's the pie chart for the two year catalog where the type of AGN we're going to be talking out about here are known as blazars, and we'll get to what makes them separate from all other AGNs a little bit later, but that class of AGN, these blazars here in the blue, 57% of the catalog outright were, were identified with blazars. And then you've got other categories, non-blazar AGN, uh, pulsars at 6%, which is pretty good, and a lot of good pulsar uh, timing studies and research has been done. Fermi's opened up a, a whole new field with gamma ray blazars, uh, pulsars, you know, that they, you know, were originally discovered in the radio. And then at Stewart Observatory, uh, the Crab Nebula, the, op the first optical pulsar was discovered way back in the late 60s. Um, supernova remnants a little bit, and then everything else basically at 1% or less. Uh, the bread here is objects that haven't been identified yet, but you can expect from statistics that over half of these will be blazars as well. So about three quarters of the objects that Fermi finds are these so-called blazars. And here's your cartoon, your NASA artistic rendering of an AGN. And this could, you could scale this picture to all kinds of uh, luminosity or brightness from the faintest AGN, which tend to be like uh, Seifert galaxies, if you may have, some may have heard of those things, to quasars, which are the brightest. So what you have here is the accretion disk. This is the material that's you know, spiraling in towards the supermassive black hole, which is this nice 
black hole there. Um, as the material, you know, rubs against, you know, other pieces of material in it, it starts to glow, it heats up, it gets faster, everything goes crazy. But it's like putting a fire hose, you know, uh, into a very small drain. There's a lot of exhaust. There's a lot of material that doesn't make it into the black hole. And it has an exhaust mechanism dominated by the magnetic fields that are in the region and probably the magnetic field that is thread through the entire accretion disk, but then gets twisted up into these polar jets here. And so the charged particles that get caught up in this are shot out of the black hole region at and accelerated at enormous velocities. And that material gets very close to the speed of light. Uh, these structures are known as jets. And a blazar basically is those AGN, those blazars that have a jet pointed almost exactly at Earth. And so we are seeing basically all of the emission that's coming from the jet because this is another you know, Einstein moment here where you know this kind of radiation if you if you get charged particles traveling close to the speed of light the light that they give off is going to be pointed in the direction of their motion so all of their brightness is it's like a a, a headlight it's forward pointed and so everything looks brighter than they really should be the emission is not going in all directions like you have from the sun um, where its energy output goes in all directions. This is highly beamed. So if you're not looking down the jet, you don't see the jet. Um, this, uh, these other, the accretion disk and all of that, that you can see from any direction. But once you're on the jet, that really tends to dominate. And that's what gives you, what we believe gives you a, a, uh, a blazar. Now, I should point out that for AGNs, even these guys with jets are only about 10% of the AGN population. Most AGN do not have jets. And that's one of the great mysteries of AGN research and always has been is why the majority of AGNs don't produce these jets or the jet starts out and it's quenched somehow for some reason it, it isn't able to escape the environment and so we don't see it um, but a minority of known AGN do have these jets and basically the division comes from the original radio observations AGN that have jets are radio loud they're very bright in the radio those that don't aren't but we don't really know what causes the difference between radio quiet and radio loud. All right. And here's a, a more uh, numerical uh, bit about this jet. Here is the M87 jet, an optical picture taken from HST. Uh, you can see the core here. That's where your supermassive black hole would be and any accretion disk. It's just a point source. It's not, um, uh, uh, you can't resolve it even with HST with a tenth of an arc second resolution. But look at this beautiful thin jet coming out from it. We're not on the axis of the jet. So the core here is a lot brighter than the jet components. We'd have to be off to the side some here to get aligned with the jet to see. And then we would think we would see a blazer. So the type of object in this picture, the type of object you see depends on your viewing angle. If you're viewing it one way, you see one type of AGN. If you're off that jet axis, then it won't be a blazer. It'll be, you'll see it as something else and classify it as something else, like just a regular quasar or a Seifert galaxy. And um, here's the theoretical look at it. This is a logarithmic scale of, about the jet. And you get all your emission from the accretion disk here, where it says IR here. You get IR all the way through X-ray or optical radio. Uh, not the radio, I'm sorry. Uh, but basically, infrared through X-ray, most of the light is coming from the accretion disk. 
Now with the jet, if you're aligned with the jet, you've got these blobs of plasma coming out at close to the speed of light. They're collimated by and accelerated by the magnetic field. And so they're constantly speeding up and they run into shock fronts. And when they do that, you get a big flare of emission and um, you see the object brighten. Now the emission you're seeing from the jet is something that you're probably not too familiar with. I mean, the accretion disk, you could, you can understand that in terms of that's uh, material, it's heated by friction and whatnot. So it starts to glow because it's hot and it's like what the sun does, right? You're seeing a hot surface. So it's bright, it's giving off light. Here is the emission coming from the jet is known as non-thermal emission as opposed to like, like starlight, which is thermal emission. Non-thermal emission is just charged particles like electrons moving through a magnetic field. And they you know, oscillate in the magnetic field because they are charged. And any accelerated charge gives off radiation. And in the, in the case of electrons, which is mostly what we're talking about here, it's known as synchrotron radiation. And so it has nothing to do with the temperature of the material or anything. It's just the acceleration of the particles in a magnetic field that creates the light that you see. And again, remember, the, all the light from this jet is also heading down the jet in the same direction. And the material creating the light is almost traveling as fast as light. So you can imagine you get all kinds of strange effects and that um, really can be seen at very, very high resolution. And many of you may know of uh, a technique called uh, radio in interferometry and very long baseline interferometry. So we're talking in wavelengths here, radio centimeter wavelengths. They can actually image uh, objects down to, if they're bright enough, and, and these blazars are bright enough, they can image these objects down to resolutions of milli arc seconds. So a thousandth of an arc second. So very tiny scales on the sky. And you can actually see these blobs moving away from the core of a blazar in the radio. At all other wavelengths, the blazar looks like a point source, just like a star. You can't, you don't get any spatial information. These blobs, though, look like they're moving faster than the speed of light. And they're, therefore, they got coined the term superluminal motion and these components moving down the jets. And it's all a, a, um, a manifestation of Einstein's theory of relativity. And it all comes from the fact that the light you're seeing is coming from material that is itself traveling close to the speed of light. And that's why it, 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 apparently these things are moving faster than the speed of light. They really aren't because as we know, as Einstein uh, said, and we've experimentally haven't disproved it yet, uh, that nothing travels faster than the speed of light. But this made this class of object very, very interesting because uh, um, and remember that the gamma rays are coming from the jet as well. You, and uh, no other really very few AG, other types of AGN that don't have jets show gamma ray radiation. So this jet's a big feature of, of you know, where the emission is, is, is coming from. And the goal here, uh, the long-term goal here is to try to understand this jet. I mean, it's producing an extremely powerful uh, structure in the universe. Um, and uh, it's very extreme physics. It's something we cannot reproduce in the lab, certainly. And so you're trying to understand, you know, the origin and how these jets stay collimated or aligned, how they are so narrow, and um, you know, just how they develop, uh, what material does within them, and and, and things like that. Um, and I should also point out in case people are getting a bit nervous over how powerful these objects are, since they're the most luminous objects in the universe, that one shouldn't lose sleep over these objects uh, because basically they're all dead now. 
uh, these were also looking far back into time at high redshifts. So we're looking at very distant objects. We don't see these kinds of objects except for this, this relatively weak M87 jet that are you know, relatively local to us. So this phenomenon has died out uh, in the past and uh, we don't believe very many of these objects exist in the nearby universe. So you don't have to worry about whether or not a beam is going to intersect with the earth and vaporize us. Um, except that, you know, in one instance during this program, it, it looked like if a brightening of an object continued for another six months, we'd all be dead, but it didn't do it, so. All right, so first, first year of, of Fermi. Uh, Fermi, given a sensitivity, this is, remember, this is the first time we have had the sensitivity to follow what a blazar does with time. We've not had the ability to follow a source and see if it gets brighter or fainter, follow it like a lot of you follow variable stars, right? And that's what you're looking at here for this particular blazar, 3C454.3 in the first year of Fermi. So the y-axis here is just how bright it is in gamma rays. Um, so the higher it is on the graph, the brighter the object is. And then this is just time. This is a, a, a modified Julian date. Um, so this is just day number. And each point here represents the observation of a, of a complete day by Fermi. And we were all back, this is now, remember, this is 2008, 2009. We were all gasping at just how spectacular this curve and this outburst was. It was a double peaked outburst that comes up, goes down here, comes up, and then fades off. These red symbols here are just upper limits. These are days where Fermi didn't detect the object, so you, but you can, you can calculate just how faint the object had to be in order for it not to be detected. And that's called an upper limit. And then it comes back a little bit brighter and whatnot. And we were all suitably impressed. After two years, here's our first flare here. We got even more impressed. Here we got a triple big outbursts in the object, in the gamma rays. So this is three, uh, this is uh, years one and two of Fermi and everything in year two here was, it was just a great year. We were having great fun at the telescope watching this thing. And then if we go to year three, here's our original way down here. We got this thing way up here, three days worth of, you know, absurdly bright gamma ray stuff. And then after this period of activity, it died down at the end of the third year and you have nothing but upper limits here, but you can see the range of variability here and how much it varies in a day because each of these points represent a day um, is, is enormous in the gamma rays. So this is a rather typical behavior for blazars. They all kind of show this in the gamma rays, This this wild variability. So now this is sort of a, I could, I'll try to skip over this slide pretty, pretty quickly. Um, this is basically just telling you how we think, what the light, where the, what mechanism is producing the light we're seeing. And blazars have a very simple spectrum. This is frequency here or wavelength where your, your long wavelengths is out here. So your radio emissions out here, your gamma rays is, is over here where the numbers get big on the uh, x-axis here. And you can see that the energy output of these objects is just a big double hump where the primary hump here is that synchrotron radiation I was talking to you about, light coming off a rapidly moving electron that's moving in a magnetic field. So that's what's known as the primary spectrum, because now you've got, remember, you've got these electrons moving at close to the speed of light. 
Now, if they run into a fo another photon, say a, a lower energy photon, there can be a big scattering event that transfers a lot of the electrons energy to the photon. Say it's an infrared photon, some very weak, very tired photon out here somewhere. An elect a relativistic electron, a very high rapidly moving electron hits it it boosts that infrared photon way into the gamma ray region. And that's where we think we're getting our gamma rays from in these objects. And that's known as inverse Compton <laughs> radiation. I know that's, you know, uh, this is getting sounding rather complicated, but that's all it is, is the, the electron, the fast electron runs into a photon boosts it to a higher energy into the gamma ray range, and then Fermi can detect it. And that's how the gamma rays are, 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 are found. Uh, the inverse Compton comes from the fact that if you take an electron, you know, one just sitting there, and a photon hits it, the electron will start moving. That's called Compton scattering. That's what phys physicists have you know, known about that for uh, a long, long time, since the 1800s. But this inverse Compton, the opposite effect, the electrons moving real fast, hits a, you know, a photon of low energy, boost it into a higher energy, much higher energy. That's inverse Compton. And that we've, uh, you know, basically was a 19th century, I mean, a 20th century development uh, in physics, understanding that, uh, understanding that process. So, you can see though here that from radio through x-rays, the synchrotron emission is dominating and optical is in there. Uh, optical is around where it says uh, 14 and 15 here. So here's the optical emission here. Fermi's very sensitive, of course, in the other region, the inverse Compton region. So it would be good for this experiment to get some optical observations of these objects to see how the synchrotron emission, what it's doing when you're looking at these big variations in the, in, in the uh, gamma rays. And that's what we set out to do here on the ground at, at, in Southern Arizona uh, to do. Uh, because in the theoretical picture, you'd expect the two components are, are very much connected because when the synchrotron emission goes up, say you've got more relativistic electrons, you can expect more inverse Compton light or more gamma rays. So let's test it. Let's see what happens. Uh, let's see, basic questions. We'll go quickly over here. Where's, we want to know where the emission's coming from in the jet. Only the radio VLBI can resolve a jet in these objects. All the other, as I said before, all the other uh, wavelengths, you just can't do it. We don't have the resolution. Um, what are the connections between the gamma rays and lower energy emissions, say the optical or the infrared or the radio? Um, how close to the supermassive black hole are these sources of gamma ray emission and the optical light? I should mention that, remember those light curves of, of Fermi that I showed for that one blazar where you saw those big outbursts. Because they're so fast, that means these emission regions are very tiny, are very small, you know, maybe a solar, the size of the solar system, maybe a little bit bigger, maybe a lot smaller. Uh, than the solar system as a whole. They're, they have to be very uh, small regions to be able to show you such rapid extreme variability. It's just a, 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 an argument having to do with how fast light travels, right? If you have an explosion and light's moving out from that explosion at one part of the source and it takes one year to get to the other part of the source to make that brighten, you got to wait a year. Well, we're only having to wait less than a day. So these these uh, these regions are tiny, and of course, how the magnetic field structure, which is very important for our understanding of how the jet is kept collimated or kept narrow, and uh, you know how the all these charged particles are accelerated down it. The magnetic field is is very important. Um, so we set out to use uh, telescopes at Steward to monitor the brightest gamma ray blazars for a long period of time. The two major telescopes used were the Bach telescope on Kitt Peak 
and the 61 inch telescope uh, on Mount Bigelow. Uh, we also, uh, I snuck in some time at the six and a half meter MMT telescope at Mount Hopkins uh, when I was supporting um, uh, observing runs by, for other astronomers uh, at there because the instrument we were using was the same at all at all telescopes. And this was the instrument that Gary Schmidt uh, built back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, it's the S-pole spectropolarimeter. Um, and unlike most instruments today, um, which basically stay at one telescope, and most, a lot of instruments today are huge, you know, many tons um, to examine the light coming uh, through the telescope. This is a very compact instrument. It's probably total, if you kept all the components together, maybe 150 pounds. We can break it into parts, put it into boxes, and uh, truck it over to uh, uh, another telescope site. In fact, the instrument actually has been used in Australia uh, back in the mid-1990s. It, it was used at the 72-inch Australian National University observatory about a year before that entire observatory burned to the ground due to a wildfire, which was a real tragedy. Um, and we, of course, as you know, uh, have to worry about wildfires here, uh, especially like this year, 2003 was a bad year. Uh, so this instrument is, has been threatened by fire before, but since it's nice and portable, we can, uh, we, we hope to be able to escape the uh, the flames on it. But this was an important thing about uh, this project was the same instrument was used for all observations. And that really gives you a nice uniform data set that can be used to compare to the beautifully uniform data set that, that Fermi gives you. Because you know, you're only using those two, two instruments to do things. And so here's what an observation with S-Pole uh, looks like. Um, so I've got three panels here. Um, the instrument measures both the brightness of light as a function of wavelength over the optical range. And this optical range here is down here on the x-axis. This is uh, the wavelength of the light in angstroms. Uh, this is blue light over here at 4,000 angstroms and red light out here at about 7,7500 angstroms. And this is almost exactly the sensitivity of your, of your eyes. Um, we don't see much bluer than 4,000 angstroms. We don't see much redder than beyond that. So this is all the colors that your eyes can perceive are on this graph. Um, so it can measure you know, the, the brightness of the object, of course, this, this is what's known as a spectrum. And here's a spectrum of another blazar, three different dates, uh, uh, well, four different dates. I've got one down here too. You can see the tremendous range and brightness you can have for the blazar here. And you can see um, this is uh, within the same month. It's a bit of a change here too, maybe 20%, uh, maybe less than that in brightness, change in brightness. This is an emission line. These are emission lines in the quasar spectrum. Uh, this is from hot gas around the quasar. They're broad because the gas is moving very fast. Uh, the instrument, what makes the instrument more unique, you've got lots of instruments to, to give you spectra. Uh, what makes this instrument unique is it can give you the polarization of the light, which um, I really don't have enough time to go uh, very much into it, uh, polarized, but you know that light can be polarized. Anybody that's worn a pair of Polaroids as sunglasses knows this by just tilting their heads and seeing the sky brightness change. That's polarization. It's caused by many physical effects. The ones we're most useful, uh, most used to are, is just bouncing light off of, uh, off of atoms, like sunlight bouncing off of atoms in the Earth's atmosphere that polarizes the light just from geometry. Um, and so you get a lot of polarized light. Our eyes are not naturally sensitive to polarized light, but insects are very much sensitive to polarized light. And that's how they, we think they get their direction 
um, because their eyes can detect polarization. They know, you know, which way is, is which because the maximum polarization you'll get from the sky is 90 degrees away from the sun and things like that. So you can get it that way. But in this case, the polarization is coming from another uh, manifestation of non-thermal radiation that I was talking about before. When you put an electron in a magnetic field and it's giving off light because it's being accelerated by the magnetic field, that light is also very highly polarized. And so not only are these jets variable in brightness, they give off polariz polarization and that polarization itself is highly variable because how highly polarized the object looks depends on how uniform the magnetic field is. If it's very, very uniform, you get very, very high polarization. If, it's, if the magnetic field's tangled, everything cancels out and you get polarization close to zero. And this is the middle here. This example is the highest polarization we saw during the program of observing uh, gamma ray blazars uh, with Fermi. Um, and this instrument gives you the polarization as a function of wavelength as well. And this blue curve here, which corresponds to the blue curve up there. So December 22nd, 2017, I measured the highest polarization ever seen from blazar. And in the blue here, it's getting to about 50% polarized, which is just absurd. That means the emission region in the blazar, in that jet, the magnetic field was very, very uniform. Um, and here are the other curves to go, go with it. And this is the polarization angle down here is the low. It's the plane of the polarization. And that gives you important information too, because the synchrotron radiation that's giving out the polarized light, the angle you see on the sky of the polarization gives you 90 degrees from the direction of the magnetic field. So it actually gives you some geometrical information as to how the magnetic field is pointed on the sky. It's 90 degrees from the angles you see here. So on that blue night here where it was very, very high polarization, the angle was around 80 degrees on the sky, so almost east-west. So the magnetic field was almost north-south on the sky. And so that's, that's, that's pretty unique information. Fermi cannot measure polarization. We do not, we lack the, we lack the technology to measure uh, gamma ray uh, polarization. So we don't have that information, but we do have it in the optical. And here's, here's a back to that original blazar we showed you. Here is a two week observing run uh, and here's what basically we were trying to do. Uh, here's Fermi going along daily in the blue here, giving its um, gamma ray flux, how bright the thing is in gamma rays. And here's the optical measurements of brightness. And you can see that the flare in the gamma rays is the same time as the flare in the optical. There's your connection between the two. And in this case, the polarization peaked at about 12% on that, on that night. And then right after, you know, the flare decays rather quickly, so does the polarization. It comes way down to only a few percent. And then we bounce around um, some more and you can see what the angle's doing. And so by taking this data set, we're trying to figure out what the heck is going on in the jet. But we did prove that at least some of the time, the optical and the gamma ray are very highly associated with each other, which is basically telling us that the emissions coming from the same place. You're getting the gamma rays from the same place, you're getting the optical emission. All right, and if you put together all the observations we've taken, this is sort of what you get. Here are two blazars, here's the infamous 3C454.3 and another blazar over here showing you first on the top panel the gamma ray brightness as a function of time and this is over 10 years. This is how long we did the optical program from 2008 to 2018. It drove Dennis Means out of the field um, 
you know, he just, he just left because it was just too much. Gary Rosenbaum stuck it out, but he's, you know, it's taken a toll. Here's the optical curves. And of course, there's a lot more gaps here. Weather, the, the time when the, the blazar is just a little bit too close to the sun to observe. Um, so you can see the years here. Here's year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, and you can see that things aren't as simple as that first example I gave you. You can see gamma ray outbursts that don't have any equivalent optical, although possibly my optical observations just missed that time. There were a lot of other observatories around the world watching them just in flux. I was one of the few that was also doing polarization, which I was uh, most interested in. I, my, my work, I'm trying to connect you know, the polarization with what's going on in the brightness of the object. And so far, I have to say, I, I haven't been able to find a, a clear connection between them. It's, it's, it's very chaotic as these graphs show. The bottom two panels here, this is polarization. You can see this object got up to almost 30%, uh, but that's not associated with anything major going on in the gamma rays, whereas um, this big peak here, you know, you could say it's a little bit bright in the optical, but it's certainly far from being, you know, up here. Um, here's 3C454.3 again, and it, it does, it's an object that does show good correlations between the optical and the gamma ray. The peaks of the optical tend to line up with the peaks of the gamma ray. Um, although, you know, the fact that this huge flare here is not the largest optical flare that we see over here. So, you know, there are differences here too. And you can see the polarization is you know, much more chaotic here. But we do go through a period that when it's faint in the gamma rays, faint in the optical, it's very lowly polarized. These, this VLBI line you see in the angles here, that is the angle on the sky of the jet. And you can see for this object, it lines up pretty good with the jet, which means the magnetic field projected on the sky is perpendicular to the jet, which is kind of what we expect. That's the orientation the field has to be in order to collimate the jet and to accelerate it down the jet, accelerate the material down the jet. Here on this object here, although we've got good color correlation and flux between outbursts, you know, if anything, the polarization angle is avoiding the VLBI jet direction. So there's no clear trend there. Two more objects, um, BLAC. Uh, the uh, prototype for the BLAC objects that were mentioned way earlier in the talk, uh, they show a, a, a slightly different behavior than the quasars do, uh, which were like the last two guys. Both, both types are considered blazars, but uh, there are subtle differences between them. And one of them you see in their gamma ray behavior where it's a lot more chaotic. You don't see these organized big flares, but the, the variations from day to day are typically as big or even bigger than you see in the quasars, like this guy over here, CTA uh, 102. And you can see the uh, light curve here and the polarizations and the angle. The angle here, generally, I mean, there's a huge scatter. The angle can be found anywhere, but it preferentially likes to be around the VLBI position angle of the jet here. Um, in CTA, this was a very impressive flare. And of course, it happened in gamma rays and optically. The optical flare was incredible. Now, as you probably, many of you probably know, the brightest quasars in the sky are about between 12th and 13th magnitude. Um, this guy usually sits, when he's down here, he's usually down at 17 to 18th when it's down here in, in the optical. This flare brought it up to 11th magnitude. 
It became the brightest quasar in the sky for a brief period around Christmas, and I forget the year though, but it was, I, I remember that. I even got my 10 inch mead out into the backyard, got my little SBIG um, uh, CCD on it and got one of the points close to the peak of that point. I didn't have telescope time. I should mention that this project uh, was basically a week to 10 days at a telescope every month for 10 years. But of course, I'm missing, you know, three quarters of the time uh, because, you know, one person just can't observe every night for 10 years. I mean, you know, the project as it was uh, basically uh, mentally destroyed me. Um, I didn't need any more time at the telescope. So um, this is an object that was going up so fast uh, in brightness that I, I made a quick calculation at the time that in six months, the thing would have been as bright as the sun. And with two suns in the sky, we probably wouldn't have come out of that. But fortunately, 11th was its peak. And so um, we averted disaster there. All right. so. Uh, it was basically almost a thousand nights uh, were spent at these telescopes. Um, and the three I mentioned before, the Bach, the Kuiper, and the MMT, uh, were all done with uh, the s pole instrument. Data, I was able to obtain at least some data on 843 of these nights over the 10 years. And here are the, the breakdown for the, for the different telescopes. The MMT was a very minor contributor as I stole a little bit of time on other people's programs to do uh, uh, quasars that were doing something good at the time. Um, and uh, about 10% of the nights were lost to completely to weather. So um, it was a lot of time. <laughs> and in that time, we were able to get almost 13,000 optical polarization me measurements. And over those 10 years, 80 blazars were, were observed although I would say probably about two dozen were observed uh, over um, two or 300 times. So that's the, main, that's the main sample of this experiment are those objects that I observed a lot every night that I could. That gives you the most unbiased comparison to what's going on in, in the gamma rays. Um, Photometrically, uh, about 10,000 nights. The difference being is that I really did need the skies to be clear in order to make a good measurement of the brightness of the object. Um, so I couldn't, in polarization, you can work through cirrus and, and, and less than optimal conditions, but not for photometry. Um, one can look at all of this data at this website. This is open to the public, just like NASA's uh, Fermi data set and the gamma rays. Um, and uh, it's available. And that was the main uh, mission. That's why NASA gave us the grant funding to pursue it, is to have this optical set to go with the gamma rays. Um, and in addition to the general program of monitoring these things in two cases during the 10 years, we were quickly able to identify what object Fermi was seeing for the first time as a flare happened on a faint blazar and Fermi announced that they were seeing something at such and such a location. And of course, their resolution is only about a little bit better than a degree. So there could be a few blazars within that degree. Which one is it? And so I, you know, swung the telescope over as quickly as I could to look at the candidates. And it was pretty easy to see which one was doing the, which was undergoing the outburst. And here's an example. Um, this was on October 10th, 2010. This was is from the Digital Sky Survey or basically from the Palomar Schmidt plates done way back in the 1950s at Palomar. And here is looking, this is what the S-Pole instrument sees. This is how you spend your night looking at the sky. Um, this is the slit of the spectral polarimeter. So any object I put in this black little rectangle here, 
the light will then go to the rest of the instrument and get measured both how many photons you get and its polarization. So uh, before putting an object in there to go over and look at it, here's the quasar in outburst that was giving you the, uh, the gamma ray signal. Here it was back when they took a picture of it. While well, you can barely see a, uh, barely a blip there uh, in the noise of the sky. These two stars here are of course these two things here. And so we did that for two and that does it. And I hope I didn't go too, too far over time, but I'm pretty sure I did. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, we have one comment from Chris who says that we've seen the M87 jet visual knot through the 40 inch at the Chiricahua Astronomy Complex, which is our um, Southern Arizona dark sky site that TAAA has. And, and Chris continues that we imaged it there as well. Great, so, super. Yeah. Any, any, any particular filtering? Any particular color was used or? I'm not sure about the, the, um, the, uh, the imaging uh, uh, in terms of the filtering. Uh, certainly for visual work, you know, we, we needed every photon. So that we were just looking straight on. Right. It, but it, it, it would be, it would seem to me that the jet would show up best in the blue uh, contrast wise because the, the host galaxy is very red and the jet is, you know, it, it's, emitting over all colors. So it would be a much bluer uh, uh, structure in, in your picture than the, than the host galaxy stars, which will be like uh, K-type stars uh, in a giant elliptical galaxy like that. So a, blue fil a bluish filter, a, a kind of a wide blue filter may be the ideal choice there. But you know, if white light works, white light works. Yeah, we can try that next Thank spring you. at the RMO. We'll do that. Um, That's a good idea. Yeah. And um, Paul is going to be here for a breakout session. And um, so you can continue questions and discussion with him in the breakout session. And um, Jim Knoll indicates that we don't have any questions on Facebook. So um, I'm going to now thank our Facebook people for coming. We're very glad that you were here tonight. We hope that you will look us up um, in our website um, at tucsonastronomy.org. And there you can learn more about us and learn more about the sky, as well as um, you can join if you'd like to, and you can donate if you'd like to. So please come to our website and please come visit us again. And I'll say goodbye to our Facebook people for tonight. And we hope to see you at our next meeting, which will be January 8th. May, and, uh, yes. before we let Facebook go, uh, I think Jim Knoll was going to do the planet report. Okay, if you want, yes, if you want to include them in the planet report, that would be wonderful. And so we'll close them out after that. Right. Okay, Jim. Okay, um, so we have a couple of things coming up uh, this month. The very uh, first one is actually going to be tomorrow night. We will be uh, streaming our next live uh, virtual star party. It'll be going to our Facebook page. So for you, those of you on Facebook, it's the same place uh, where, where this one was. And we're going to spend probably about uh, an hour and a half or two hours. Uh, first half, we'll be looking at uh, certain objects that we've kind of picked out. And then the second portion, if anybody has objects that they want to look at, then they can uh, let us know. So that'll be a virtual star party tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Arizona time. Now, the other thing that's coming up, and this is, this is really big, is December 21st, the winter solstice. And we will have one of the closest conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn in a very long time. They're gonna to get to within about 0.1 degree of each other. So with the naked eye, you're gonna actually struggle to be able to separate them. Um, so definitely take a look at them with, uh, with binoculars. Um, we are going to do a live stream with the telescope for about an hour. 
that evening as well, probably starting at about six or 6.15. And we'll, uh, we'll try to uh, put the scope on there and talk about Jupiter and Saturn and uh, make sure that everybody has an opportunity that wants to, to uh, view it through, um, through a telescope. So I'm just make sure you let your family and friends know about that. So the last time I think that these two planets got this close together visually was back in 1226. So that's like 794 years ago. Now that's, that's when they got this close and was visible to us. Sometimes they'll do that and still be in the glare of the sun or they won't be you know, visible, both, both objects won't be visible. Uh, the next time that they, they're gonna get this close is going to be uh, 2080, I think. So for the youngsters out there, uh, you know, they might be still around to uh, be able to watch it in 2080, but this might be our, uh, for most of us, this might be our best shot. So uh, make sure you let your family and friends know and uh, get outside. Um, if you, you know, if you, for, for members, if you've got a telescope, put it on there. It's gonna be pretty low uh, in the West, they both set um, about 7.30 on the 21st and sunsets about 5.30. So, you know, they can be pretty low in the West, but it's still a great opportunity to, to look at it through a telescope or some binoculars. And then if you don't, uh, just encourage your, uh, your friends and family to uh, come to our Facebook page and, and we can chat about what we're seeing through the telescope. So those are the two things that we've got uh, coming up this month. One was December 21st, and what was the date of the other? Uh, the virtual star party is tomorrow night, December 5th. Tomorrow night. Okay, so two activities about two weeks apart there. Great.